Dasein is an ordinary German word. It means something like existence or more literally being there. But it's also the heart of one of the most interesting and problematic works of modern philosophy ever written, Martin Heidegger's Being and Time. What I want to do is just take you through some of what he might have meant by that term and why we should care about it. The first question we've got to work out is, who or what is Dasein? So John Hoagland, the great American philosopher, suggested that on Heidegger's picture, pretty much anything could be Dasein. He said it could be people, Cincinnati, or General Motors. Any kind of large-scale, complex human structure. More recently, however, scholars have tended to think that sets things a little too broad. That Dasein is really Heidegger's name for individual humans and the distinctive situation we find ourselves in. Now, why do you need a new word for that? After all, it's not as if individual humans and our distinct situation is something no one's ever thought of before, right? The easiest way to approach this is in terms of a remark from Diltai. So Diltai was worried about what he called the bloodless subject of traditional philosophy. And the thought here is that the way the subject is presented by people like Kant and others, in some sense, misses the nature of human experience, the viscerality, the complexity, the personal dimension. This is the bloodless idea. You know, if you read the first critique, you read Kant's first critique, it tends to suggest that most of human existence is spent devising Newtonian theorems or um, making causal judgments. And obviously there's going to be some of that. But one of the key ideas of modern philosophy is that this whole other sway of human life, from sexuality to emotion to social roles, which was being left out. And part of what Heidegger is trying to do with the idea of Dasein is to bring that back in. Now we could pick out three features that are important within that. The first is the social dimension. So Dasein for Heidegger is always understanding itself in terms of a certain social role. You're not just a blank subject, you're a lesbian or a carpenter or both or neither or all of the above and none of the above, you're seeing yourself in a certain way, in a certain society that's putting certain pressures on you, that's setting you certain goals that you're reacting to, that you're trying to make sense of yourself in this ongoing complex social situation. The subject is always a social subject for Heidegger. The second thing he wants to bring in is mood or emotion. It's very important for him that the subject is always in a certain mood. You're bored, you're depressed, you're anxious, you're excited, you're nervous. And that these moods inflect and alter the rest of our experience. So if you think, for example, of your experience of time when you're really excited versus your experience of time when you're incredibly bored. Okay. The phenomenology of those two cases differs radically. Some moods, he thought, were particularly important philosophically. They were the kind of royal road to understanding who we really are. And in characteristic existentialist fashion, he had a, a soft spot for anxiety. If you focus on anxiety and on the experience there, you'll learn a bit about who we really are and what the real nature of the human situation is. The third feature of Dasein that's very important to him is death. We're finite, mortal subjects. And he's interested in the sense in which people either face up to that fact or dodge it and duck it. You can see how this links into a topic covered elsewhere in these videos, this idea of authenticity or inauthenticity. Authentic agents for Heidegger accept their finitude, accept that they're going to die and live their life in the light of that fact. Inauthentic agents talk round it, ignore it, pretend it's not going to happen or to be someone else, I'll probably be okay. So you can see here how this links in with those ideas of authenticity or inauthenticity. Do you face up to who you really are? So those are some of the changes that Heidegger wants to introduce with this idea of Dasein. It's very much a subject with blood in its veins, a subject in a particular society doing particular things, seeing itself in a particular way, with moods, emotions, and only perhaps a few short years to live. It's very different from, say, Kantian apperception. How does this new model of the subject relate to the classic philosophical problems? Well, let me give you two examples. So the first is scepticism. Heidegger has this kind of classically Heideggerian line, um, which is both both incredibly beautiful and utterly frustrating, where he says that the, the, the scandal of philosophy, so Kant talked about, he said it was a scandal of philosophy that we hadn't yet proved the existence of the external world. 
And Heidegger says the real scandal is not that we haven't proved the existence of the external world, it's that people keep asking about it. Okay? So for Heidegger, the scandal is not that we haven't dealt with scepticism, it's that we think scepticism needs dealing with. So part of what's happening with Dasein is, supposedly when you understand the nature of Dasein and its relationship to the world around it, what Heidegger calls being in the world, you'll see that the old sceptical problems just fall away, that they're in some sense incoherent or secondary or distorted. So you can see kind of Wittgensteinian themes coming in here. You don't answer the sceptic directly. You show that he or she has misunderstood the basic framework in which they're asking the question. The second classic philosophical issue that comes up very strongly is what you might call the transcendental structure. So Heidegger emphasises history a great deal, much more than someone like Kant. He talks about the way in which our understanding changes through history, changes through social change. But on the other hand, it often looks like he's trying to come up with a general ahistorical theory of historical change and the way in which our understanding switches as our society does. So you've got this tussle that you see really starting with Hegel onwards about how philosophy and history are going to go together. Can you have a general theory of historical change? Can you say general philosophical things about the way in which our self-understanding, our self-conception alters through time? Or do you, to take a position that Foucault sometimes toys with, need to forget about universals altogether, forget about the idea of a subject, even a historicized subject, and just talk about individual historical periods and their pictures of themselves in the world? So what we've got so far is Dasein as a certain way of thinking about humanity, and Dasein linking to some classic philosophical problems. Heidegger like to sum all this up in terms of being. The problem, he thought, was that we'd failed to grasp our own being, the distinctive nature of who we are. What happens after Heidegger? Well, let me give you... Let me mention two points. One is a number of authors within the phenomenological tradition become worried that Heidegger himself has ironically overlooked the key thing, which is, of course, that we're not disembodied subjects, that we're subjects with blood in our veins, flesh on our bones, subjects with very much a physical place in the world, and that that physicality needs to be captured and understood, and the way it differs, for example, between one person and another. And so you get the kind of tradition that you see running to people like Merleau-Ponty. To really understand the subject, we need to understand the body. And that's a body that, for all Heidegger's emphasis on concrete everyday life, he doesn't say much about. Another development, or another, um, in some ways, another blind spot in early Heidegger is the question of animals. To frame this idea of Dasein, what's distinctive about humans, he sets a very, very hard line between humans, rational animals, as you might call them, and non-rational animals, dogs, cats, giraffes, chimpanzees, dolphins. You can see it starts to get a bit problematic. For Heidegger, there's a very sharp line. We are Dasein, whatever they are, they're definitely not. And that leads some people, for example, John Gray, the political theorist, to talk about Heidegger as having a, an essentially theological orientation still, that humans are special in some way, made in, in the image of some kind of god, distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. Now, part of what's happening here is Heidegger is channeling the latent anti-naturalism that you find in a lot of phenomenology. Part of what's happening, though, is because he wants to focus on what's so special and distinctive about human beings, he's come up with this category that to some degree isolates them from what you might think are very similar entities. How much difference really is there, philosophically, between the kind of capacities that we have to use tools and the kind of capacities that sophisticated animals do Dasein is an attempt to articulate what's distinctive about us, but the worry is that it, in doing so it severs us from the broader context in which we need to be understood.